It's June 12th, 2007, and I'm Barbara Garrity Blake, and I'm talking to Dr. Chuck Minuch, Charles Minuch, I should say, right? Charles Minuch, yeah, that's, okay. well, either one's fine. The third? The third. The mm -hmm. third, okay. Yep. All right, Chuck, if, um, if I may, let's start with some background information. Tell me about what your specialty was, where you went to school, what okay. you were studying in the early years. Okay. I went to Campbell University back in 1963 yeah. and graduated after three years and one summer there. And I majored in sociology. And then got out of, got out, out of there and had uh, two or three little jobs and wasn't satisfied, so uh, went to state college. All right, so you were just saying... I knew there was something I liked about you, a sociology major <laughs> yep, at Campbell. That's okay. right. So I worked with that for only a couple of years, and I, I, I really liked biology. I grew up liking the outdoors and natural history. So I um, took some courses, was fortunate enough to get a job with the Florida uh, Freshwater Fish Commission, Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. Worked there for a couple of years in freshwater fisheries management and did a little research down there too, primarily management. Um, and then entered graduate school at NC State University, got my master's in 72 and my Ph.D. in 75. And as you can imagine, I had to make quite a shift in the types of courses that I was taking. So um, that was interesting, and it was tough at times, and, but I really, I really enjoyed it. So mm -hmm. I've had, uh, I had some good training with that, with the education. Then I got a job with NIMPS in 1972, and I worked there for 30 years. And I've seen things change drastically during that time, naturally. Uh, some for the good, many for the bad, and be glad to talk to you a little bit about that. But that's kind of my, my early background. But when you were a graduate student, what was your topic? What was your I research? did, for my master's, I worked with striped bass in the Roanoke River um, and actually published a book on the Roanoke River entitled Spring Comes to the Roanoke. And we work, worked very closely with recreational and commercial fishermen on a daily basis, and that was very rewarding. I mean, that was, that was neat. And we did the tagging studies, the aging growth, the reproductive studies, all those typical basic biological things that we do, uh, and then made recommendations for management. Um, my Ph.D. work was done at Beaufort at the NOAA Laboratory, and I worked with reef fish with one particular species, the red porgy, which is a pagris. It's a sparid in with that family. Um, and had the opportunity to go all over the place. Went to the Canary Islands and Morocco and Portugal and followed that species on the other side of the Atlantic and then worked with it for uh, several years over here until I got my Ph.D. in 75. And did some genetics work with the, with the fish. Actually had the name changed um, to Pagris Pagris as it is now. Uh, was one of the publications I got from my dissertation. And then I did several others on basic life history aspects, aging growth, ecology distribution, food habits, you know, reproduction, management recommendations, things like that. So that's, that's basically where I came from. I, I did, for, for, for NIMPS, I worked in, inside the laboratory with, uh, in, the, in the lab with aging growth, reproduction, and foods. That's what I really enjoyed doing, just the basic biology. And, uh, and during those early years with NIMPS, uh, we worked very closely with recreational and commercial fishermen, primarily with reef fish, but also with Atlantic Menhaden and some of the um, other things. And at that time, the NEMPS laboratory was truly a fisheries laboratory. And, of course, as you know, it's changed um, very much over the years since those early days that I was there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why don't you talk a little bit about how, what are some of the changes you saw? Well, when, uh, like I said, I had, when I worked with Florida, we worked very closely with fishermen. It was a friendly relationship. We worked together when I worked on the river with striped bass. Again, it was a friendly relationship with, with commercial as well as recreational fishermen. My first few years with the National Marine Fishery Service, the first 10, in fact, until 1983, um, very close working relationship. Um, we worked primarily with the recreational fishermen that were on boats for hire, that they either charter boats or what we know as head boats or party boats. And... Um, we met them daily as they would come in at the docks. Uh, the captains and crew were excited because they didn't know a whole lot about the fish. They knew how to catch them, but they wanted to know more about their life histories, where they spawned, how old a fish would be at a certain size, all these types of things that we began to, to discover and, and research and publish on. And so that relationship was wonderful until 1983 when we Gene Huntsman and I helped write the Fishery Management Act for the Snapper Grouper Complex for the South Atlantic Fish Management Council. And after that, we, we 
at the laboratory in in my lab particularly we kind of lost con control of where we were and what our input would be and and things changed because the fishermen for the first time incidentally back in the early days they were concerned about IRS and how we were reporting things and we we assured them that we didn't have anything to do with the federal tax and that um, so that was as close as we came to any type of conflict with them was over that but as the management plan came down and then has been amended many times over the years then things have gotten much tighter for the fishermen recreational and commercial and so they don't I don't perceive them to be as friendly as they were towards the National Marine Fisheries Service and that's one reason I'm glad I don't work there anymore. So when you say that that plan, that snapper grouper mm -hmm. plan changed things mm -hmm. and you felt like you were losing control of the mm -hmm. process, what do you mean by that? Well, Gene and I knew a lot about snapper and grouper and we knew about the fishermen in the South Atlantic, in particularly in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, East Coast of Florida, what they were catching, when they were catching them. Uh, and we had samplers that were docks, dockside every day that we talked with we, at, least, at least weekly. And so we had control over what we were reporting and what was coming in. Um, then as those that were involved in population modeling um, began to take more control over the management process, then I feel like that, 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 the, that the biological studies and the things that we'd done in the past were fine, but they were old, they were sort of passe, and the new trend, uh, and we see things evolve this way in all segments of society, but we, we, we saw the, the new trend to be population dynamics, where those that did the computing and still do today are in the laboratory, in their rooms, and not so much with the fishermen or the resource. Okay. And so that's why I said we lost control. That When we'd go to a public meeting, for instance, we'd see people there that we knew reporting and saying one thing, and the modelers may be, may, may be there or they might not be there, and if they said something, it might be in total opposition to what we, we kind of felt at that particular time. So yeah. now I'll be honest with you, I mean, that's the way, that's the way things got with us. Um, and so naturally it made my work far less enjoyable um, when, when I sort of dreaded going to the docks and seeing fishermen that I knew that, that the things that we were writing down and saying would come back to them in ways that might be detrimental to them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I wasn't sure if that was the right thing or not. Right. So that, yeah. that, got, to be, that got to be kind of a, a hard thing to do. And that seems to be such a complaint today from yeah. fishermen that there's too much emphasis on mm. models yes, that right. they don't understand or feel like, you know, their knowledge isn't incorporated or yeah. what they see isn't incorporated in the models. Right. They don't, they don't, and they also feel like a lot of times that the, uh, the mindset has already been established before the public meetings right. and that there's a, there's a clique or a group that works together to bring forward recommendations that are sort of have been have been decided before they actually make their input, mm -hmm. and I see that as a real negative too, right. and that comes from the lack of, of of really coordination and cooperation between the managers and the researchers and the modelers with the fishing public. Um, it, it seems to be not as as close as it once was. Now, do you think that fishermen see the natural world very differently than? scientists or is it just a matter of using a different vocabulary or a different what are some of the differences there well fishermen fishermen have been the ones that have been on the water a long time they see cycles uh, they see cycles irrespective of what fish fishermen are doing or what they're catching that they see cycles of weather they see cycles of abundance of young fish they see all these cycles and so they know their periods like a roller coaster it's up and down up and down up and down and they feel like that the, those that, that are doing the modeling are seeing more of the downs than they are the up and, and looking at things more over a short-term basis. Um, and, of course, in all fairness to those that are doing the mathematical modeling, they want a time series as lengthy as they can possibly get, you know, to strengthen the validity of what they're saying. So I'll give credit where it's due. But the fishermen, being out with the resource all the time, they see things sometimes very differently. Um, Fishermen will come to a meeting and say, we're catching red porgies all over the place, or silver snapper, or, you know, pagris, and, and yet they're supposed to be very rare. Um, we're seeing more red grouper now than we've seen during the time that I started in 72. So there's some things up, some things are down. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems I have, and I've been involved in papers recently that have to do with population modeling and working with reef fish in particular, is, is the, the assumption from the abstract, from the start of that paper right through, that overfishing is the cause of the decline in the stock or that particular species of fish. 
and doesn't seem to take in consideration environmental factors or other things that could have an impact on the availability of fish. Um, and I've tried to, in the papers that I've been involved with, tried to correct that and say, look, you, you, you're absolutely right. There's some problems with fishing. However, you have to be knowledgeable enough to recognize some of these other things that are taking place. The habitat can change for reef fish in particular very drastically after storms because the storms can cover over the live bottom areas that are not too high relief off our coast here in North Carolina. And when it does that, of course, the fish move to other places. And so you wouldn't go back to that same place and catch anything similar to what you did 10 years ago, for instance, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So th there's, there's all these considerations that I think should be factored in. Uh, and I think it would win, win the fishermen's confidence, I think, in particular in some of these presentations and papers, if those that were given the reports would acknowledge other factors other than fishing as being likely causes of declines. Um, I mean, you get eggs that are pelagic for most of the marine species we have that are important, and they're subject to tides, currents, and winds. And weather patterns can change the distribution and therefore year class strength drastically, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of what, what's being caught. So these things need to be at least acknowledged to show those that are reading that are not, not slanted too much toward the overfishing role, that their, their thoughts and concerns are being considered too. Right. And carry those through. And I think if you did that, you know, it would build up confidence. And I think one thing the state, the state needs to do, and NIMP certainly needs to do, is to, to, well, the state in particular, needs to tell the fishermen that they're working for them, with them, that they, that is their constituency. Those are their people and their friends. And they need to be involved with them um, throughout this whole process and incorporate their concerns, their livelihoods, their futures, all the things that they do, um, irrespective of what NIMPS is doing. That they're going to represent them, and that's a very hard thing to do. I've tried to push that um, for the last several years since I've been retired, that, that um, the director, and we have a new director over there now, that they get involved more with the, uh, <clears throat> with the people in North Carolina and tell them, you know, we are working with you through, the, through our own uh, Marine Fisheries Commission, that we recognize your pain, all the things that you're going through, and that we can take steps to try to correct that. Right. Um, and then go to NIMPS. You know, NIMPS is sort of the big, big agency as ASMFC is. And I'm not too infatuated with either one of them, but that's, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, the, that's the right. The mindset seems yep. to be going in the opposite direction. That's exactly direction. right. So it's almost too late. You know, if you ask me about a lot of the things we face in society now, it's almost too it's late. Almost too late. You, we, we're never, not. never too late. But I, we're getting into the, the huge issues in this country right now, and it's almost too late. Right. And fisheries is no exception. You know. Well, um, ten years ago, actually longer, more than ten years ago, you were on the moratorium steering. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And, yeah. And. Oh, yeah. A few others, which resulted in the 1997 Fisheries Reform Act. That's right. Do you feel good about that? I feel good about the work because I know we worked hard. Mm -hmm. And I know that we've been, you know, people that don't understand the process have said things that, you know, that we, that, that but it, there might be some controversy with that. But I know involved with it where I was coming from, where in, in particular where you were coming from too, uh, that we cared very much for the fishing public and their 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 livelihoods and what they were doing. Um and and when we were trying to do that, and so I, yeah, I felt I felt wonderful when we got through with that. I felt yeah. really good because we did some wonderful things. We worked with a commission, we worked with licensing, and we took these big hard issues and worked with them. And it it wasn't because we had to; we wanted to, and we we were fortunate enough to be able to serve on that committee. Um, and it took a lot of work. You know, it was a lot of time, as you know, and we went all over the place in public meetings, and we learned a lot. But we exchanged a lot with the public at those meetings. And I enjoyed that process. I did, too. Yeah. And one of the things that resulted that I like is our advisory committee system. Oh, yeah, our advisory committee system is wonderful. And I, I serve on one now, the FinFish Committee for the Marine Fisheries Commission, Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, and I thoroughly enjoy that. I need to attend the meetings a little bit. <laughs> Do you but think anyway. it's working fairly well? I think the, uh, well, I see a lot of public involvement. Um, so I think it's working pretty well. I'd have to really think about some things. You know, these are these are hard hard issues, and yeah. we haven't found easy solutions to anything much. Um, well, one of the hardest things that yeah, it, mm. go ahead. Go no, ahead. it's just like the herring fishery, and and 
And I worked with that for so clo- for so long, you know. And I, I've gone back and looked at the records from 1908. And when Warehouser was not Warehouser, it was another wood company, uh, processing company in Plymouth. And things were bad then. Oh, they were horrible then. There was all this black water and mortality of alewives and blueback herons. And everybody thought it was doomsday and nothing was going to come back. And, of course, they did. And when I worked there in 1972, the, the, the herons were just as plentiful as they could be. And one of the best things I've ever done, the most rewarding, things I've ever done it was criticized by uh, different people for doing it including the city of Virginia Beach and the federal government my employer was that we had a Roanoke River water flow committee that developed guidelines for striped bass spawning and then that stock has those fish have exploded beyond any expectation and I firmly believe a lot of it has to do with springtime flows of the water that we tried to restore to pre-impoundment conditions yeah, and as that was I was criticized by the city of Virginia Beach because they had they had hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in their pipeline oh. to remove the water, and so we were at odds with them over the resource, and so that was not good. And then the federal government was it, they really didn't know what to do. You know, they the the people that were way over me, way way over me, up inside you know in D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, were very much concerned about the the pressures put on them by the city of Virginia Beach. So. Uh, they, they they wouldn't come down too friendly with us in the field and what we were doing. They tried to give us advice and all, all kinds of other things right. that we we tried to take in consideration. Because striped bass is in great shape now. Striped bass is in great shape, and undoubtedly it has to do with regulations on fishing as well as water quality and as well as uh, water flows. But in the Roanoke, water flows are really critical. The surprising thing is that striped bass have come back Hickory shad have rebounded to no levels that we have ever seen in North Carolina, as plentiful as they are now, and and yet two other river spawners, or three other, the American shad, the blueback herring, and the alewife, have not responded in similar fashion, so I don't know what the problem is. It has to be fishing as well as some other things. I don't know that if we put a complete moratorium on herrings for years and years that they'll come back until until we know enough about what's going on to correct that as well. Fishing some other things as well. Right. Now, originally, but, you were on the Herring Fisheries Management Yeah, I got off of there. Committee. Yep, got off of that. You got off of that. Yep, I did. Mm-hmm. I got a lot of, uh, I, had, I had a lot of friends. I felt like there was a little bit of a conflict there, yeah. in, in all honesty, because I had friends that, that I had worked with and it associated with socially and other things for years uh, with the towns and with the, the commercial fishing community there. And uh, I didn't feel like I could... I could serve with an open mind because I because I really love those folks and I, I love their resource and what they do and how much it means to them in the spring of the year, Easter time. It's just wonderful. It used to be a wonderful time with those fish, mm-hmm. and I felt like if I was on this committee and doing things and and I was pushed into some, some things, I just I, I didn't feel good about the process with me involved in it. Right. I'm sure right. the process did like it like it was supposed to, but I I felt like it was too too close to me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But you're still involved in fisheries management oh, with yeah. fin fish. With the fin fish, that's right. And are you involved in any federal issues anymore? Or uh, I'm still, the, the South Atlantic Council still contacts me once in a while about environmental issues, um, coral in particular, and um, some, of the, some of the areas that they want to set aside is for management. And I'll get emails and, and, and literature sent to me in the mail to read and proof, and I do that occasionally when asked to do that so that's about the only thing you know I have I have good friends over at the laboratory in Beaufort many of them have retired those my age and older are gone, long gone doing fun things now um, but I go over and see some of the folks that, that I hired and worked closely with or worked for me and it's always a pleasure they're very good friends over there mm-hmm. very good friends and so so I feel good about that laboratory and what 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 it's done over the years you know it started it was the second oldest fisheries laboratory in the United States, dated 1899. Only Woods Hole, 19, 1885, is older. And that lab started out as being really a lab that was studying fish for commercial fishermen. Mm-hmm. You know, those that were diamondback terrapins was big back at the turn of the century for the food value, particularly in mm-hmm. Baltimore and up there. And, it, and, the, and we raised them and released them and did all these things. And then our research vessel, the fish hawk, came down in the turn of the century to study oyster grounds and snapper grouper grounds for commercial fishermen so they could map them and explain them, the grounds to them. That vessel actually served as a floating laboratory for American shad hatching and releasing of young American shad. 
So in those days, that was truly a fisheries laboratory. And it was, it was feet on the ground, working with the fishermen, with the resources. And it was like that until after the Second World War. And, and, and really gradually, gradually changed after that. Uh, the Menhaden program that's gone on there has been, I guess, in existence since the 1940s. And it still collects, that, that program still collects data on Atlantic Menhaden, even though the, the fishery is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because of fisheries and social issues, as you know, right. you know things that, uh, that have caused it to, to go down. But mm -hmm. and anyway, and the recreational fishermen are getting, you know, are stronger. They, they, uh, and, 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 uh, and so the, the lab changed from commercial to commercial recreational, then more to, to recreational, and then now to, to things that I don't even recognize anymore. Yeah. And I'm sure they're doing fine things, and I don't mean to make, you know, belittle the, the research that's going on there. Uh, but they're, they're things far removed from what we used to do. Do you think the council system that we have works well, or has that become too politicized? I think it's become politicized, and I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest with you now. I have nothing to lose by yeah. telling you this. I think a lot of decisions are made at cocktail parties before the council meetings. I've been to them, been invited to them. I see how they work. It works that way with um, – I'm not going to draw an analogy with a state agency, but there's one that works very much that way that's inland. Um, in conservation, they work the same way. It seems to me like people that I know that that are really well intended in fisheries management. Once they're caught up in the council and with NIPS in particular, their their, their character changes. It, it's like they put on another uh, another suit of clothes and they begin to act like that clique is acting. And I don't I don't particularly approve of that. No. But um, I mean, you know, give it credit when it came out. Heck, the regional councils and. Um, I guess it was the Fisheries Act of 1975, I, I think it was right, develop management plans, set up these regional councils, do all the things they do. And it's a wonderful, I mean, not many countries in the world do that. I mean, we've got to look at our country and say, good gosh, we've, we're doing tremendous things in fisheries management. Some other countries don't do it too, you know, don't That's do anything. Right. And we're working with commercial as well as recreational. We're one of the few countries that has open, you know, recreational fishing going on. You go to some of these other countries and there's a, there's a little marginalized commercial fishery catching fish that are three or four inches long and nobody has the leisure or time to sit around and use a hook and line. Mm -hmm. so, so we're blessed by having, having diversified fisheries, particularly in North Carolina where we can catch them recreational and commercial. We're still able to catch them with different types of gear. I think that is a very good thing. Some people don't. But, um, so there's some very good things in fisheries that we're doing in this country that other countries don't do. Uh, but I want us to maintain a relationship with the fishermen um, as, as, as often as we can and educate them to what we're trying to do that, and that, that we're all in the same boat. Now, that's easy said. I don't know how we do that, but uh, we have to win the confidence. Um, and it, we're, we're not the enemy. We're the friends in fishery management, and we're working together. So right. that's the key thing. Have you seen fishermen become more savvy over the years when it comes to management and yeah they're getting they're getting more savvy works. yeah they're they're more savvy because of the um and and, and equipment too i mean you good lord the equipment ex exploded and what they're doing now and using in terms of fishing is far removed from what i saw in the early 70s early 80s and uh and yeah they they're, they're 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 really forced into it if they want to fish and they want to fish as a livelihood they have to become savvy in the process and where it's going that doesn't mean they have to agree with it but they have to become savvy because they have to play by the rules and when there's a public meeting if nobody shows up uh, then things are said and done and closed and the book is closed and that's it right. and so people need to attend public meetings get involved where they can even though I perceive it sometimes to be and, and, I, and that's this very negative and I don't mean to be that negative but sometimes it appears that that mind my, my mindset has been developed so you need to get there and attend the meetings and change that mindset because they've had these documents to look at them and write them for, for weeks and months, mm -hmm. and the fishermen have them a very short period of time. And uh, so, so naturally, those that have looked at it a long period of time have said, this is, this is, what's, you know, this is what's going on, this is what's, that's what we're going to do. And so they go ahead with that. The fishermen need to get in there and spend a lot of time, as much as possible, or, or representatives of the fishermen to, uh, to look at the various issues, and, and so they'll have the input they need over a period of time. Now, as a scientist, you seem to be more sensitive to the people side yeah. of things than, mm. some, than some other oh, scientists. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that, are you a people person, or is it your sociology uh, <laughs> background, or what do you think that is? <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> That's a good question. I like people. Uh-huh. I, and, and, you know, if, you, if you're raised in a community, I've always told people in Raleigh this, if you're raised in a community and your children go to school and you vote in the same place, you buy the groceries, you go to the same churches, you do all these things with your neighbors, um, then you should become closer to them. Uh, if you're in Raleigh, you don't have to. Mm-hmm. If you're in Raleigh, you don't have to get real close to somebody at Gloucester. Right. Um, but those of us here do. Um, or should. Well, you know, I agree with that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Do you think that the recreational fishermen are going to start seeing some of the same sorts of um, limits that the, you know, as far as oh, yeah. limited entry or quotas? Yeah, you know, something. Recreational fishing is exploding. How yeah, right. How will we ever... We've got to get a handle on that. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, the, commer- the recreational fishing statistics that we have are Murphy's. And they're not good. They're really not that good. For the species that I've looked at, they've been horrible. Um, and so we have to, we have to, we have to get a better. Since you mentioned, I mean, it's exploding, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a tremendous, tremendous growing thing where commercial fishing is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, we have to start addressing that segment very, you know, very strongly. And so they'll see some changes coming, I think, down the road. Um, so, yeah. Yep, that's a. Whatever. Okay. Um, I guess to sort of wrap things up, overall, do you think fisheries management has been successful in the United States? Or I guess it's not a fair question, maybe in the southeast? For some things it has. You know, it really has. For some things it's been very, you know, for anatomy species it's been very good. I, I think the catch and release of marlins that we've experienced. When I first started at NC State, I worked with their fishing school at Hatteras for, I don't know, 25 or 30 years, 25 years, and I taught courses there that were academic and ID, fish IDs and ecology and things more so than fishing. But I, in, in, when I first started, the, the marlins were brought in and dumped um, right at it, right at the docks so they would drift and form these great big bone piles that tourists would go through and get the bones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now you, you wouldn't think of doing anything like that. In fact, if you bring in a marlin now and this marlin to a big, big rock to under under 400 pounds, you're penalized. And so there's a great deal of effort being put in, in catch and release of some of the oceanic pelagics, and that's a wonderful thing. So, so yes, that's worked well there. The whole mindset has shifted to, to, uh, to a very conservation-oriented thing with with the billfish and and tunas in particular those 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 uh, fish and uh, the anatomist fish I think we've done some some good work there and there were others that are of course the bread and butter species like spot and croaker and mullets and all those others that we're just now getting a handle on and beginning to do some good solid research on the uh, on their distributions and age and growth and all those things that will go in and I hate to say into the models but that's where we're going with some of these fish and particularly you know catfishes in the sounds like in the um, low salinity sound like our moral sound and um, some of the other fishes there white perch yellow perch we're beginning to even develop management plans for those so we're reaching out and trying to manage f- fish overall and not just some of the ones that that are most often caught mm-hmm. um, so it's reaching deeper it's getting more extensive uh, and like I said, we're we're blessed, and we have a government and councils that are that are honestly set up t- to protect and to enhance and to uh, to study and manage, whereas uh, many countries don't. So in the southeast and all throughout the country, that's a very good thing. Um, we need to do a better job of re- our relations with with the fishing public, both commercial and recreational. Recreational. Now, how did you come to write such a beautiful book of fishes? Oh gosh! Well, I'd been in the fish business for a long time, and 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 uh, and, I, and I'd always have to throw together black and white photographs or little teeny things that you couldn't even see. And so I, I approached Dwayne Raber. He's 81 now, but he's probably the best fish artist, if not in the United States, certainly in North Carolina, the Southeast. He does fish for. He's gotten all kind of awards, you know, artist awards year after year after year. Where does he live? He lives in Garner now. He used to live in Cary, uh-huh. and Garner's right outside of Raleigh, and so he's very close to the Wildlife Resources Commission. He's very close to the Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh. And he and I are going to do this book again. It came out in 84. It was done 84, 88, 1992. So we had three, three um, printings of this book, and it did very well. Um, and we're getting ready to do it again. It's costly because it's full color. But being in full color, it's different from a lot of others. And each species is given two pages as opposed to 20 
little fish being crammed on one page. There are, there are wonderful fish keys out there that are very good and include more fish than we do, but we include those that are recreational and, and commercially important to the southeast, and, uh, and we, we include Maryland through the midway on the east coast of Florida, say. And what will this new volume be called? It'll be Fisherman's Guide to the Fishes of the Southeastern United States, just like the other one. Mm -hmm. It'll have updated... Uh, world records in there. We From 1984 when we did our last one until now, 2007, about 90 percent of the species, of course, the, the, the records have been broken. In fact, they're being broken all the time. It's like stopping a train. We have to stop somewhere. So we're using 2007 as, as our cutoff point, and if, if your fish doesn't make it in there or someone's fish doesn't make it, I'm sorry, it'll get in the next one, you know. So it's one of these things where you've got to say time, you know, it's time to call a halt to this and do it. But it's really interesting to see where these world records come from. And in that thing, we talk about the, the color of the fish. He's got a beautiful picture of each fish in full color. And this is fresh and salt water. Mm -hmm. So you've got mountain trout, and you've got cold water, warm water species. You've got estuarine species, and anatomy species, blue water, ground fish. You've got everything, all types of fish in there. And uh, we give a write-up on, on characteristics of the fish. Uh, you can count the lateral line scales. You can look at the spines. You could key them out if you wanted to because his art's that good. And you can look at what I write about the, uh, the the key characteristics of the fish. We talk about their life history aspects, how they feed, where they feed, when they reproduce, all these things. And then we talk about how to catch them, and then we talk about how to cook them. Mm -hmm. The cooking is basically my part. I did the writing, so the cooking is mine. And it's it's so-so. I mean, you know, there's some things in there that, that look pretty good. I've cooked everything that I say I, I put a recipe in there for, and I enjoyed it. But I, like, I enjoy more, most types of food, so that really doesn't say anything. What's your favorite um, fish to eat? I just like a, a fish with bones. I mean, I'm just, I, and it's horrible for your health. I'm on a diet right now. I'm trying to do nice things with fat and everything. But I like fried fish. I like a fried pig fish. I like a fried croaker, a fried spot, or a fried um, sea mullet, which is a kingfish, either mm -hmm. the Gulf, Southern, North. I love all of those with coleslaw, baked beans, and, you know, the bad things. Mm -hmm. And I cook it, and it's good. And the bones, to me, give good flavor. Um, and, of course, there's, there's the dolphin fish that everybody sees. There's entrees now in the better restaurants. And, um, tunas and and that's all good too. But I, I really crave the fried fish once in a while, and I have to get away from push myself back and from my diet and indulge some. <laughs> so I do that <laughs> liberally at times. Right. And my wife tolerates it. Carol likes it. I cook. I, I do most of the cooking here, so and she enjoys my fish and my game cooking. So oh, I bet she does. Yeah. So it she she didn't, didn't turn down a whole lot around here. <laughs> so. Chuck, well, the state is mighty lucky to have you. Oh, she, You've been uh -huh. a great asset. Well, I, I, I don't, I don't want to come across as being too pessimistic with with things that I've said. I just, I want to be truthful in where I uh -huh. see things, and I have worked in in this since 1968 overall, so almost 40 years. Next year will be 40 years I've been around it, so I've seen them some things, and I've seen things change. And so I just wanted to to talk to you a little bit about those things that I've I've seen from my my perspective. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add before we finish up? No, I think we've uh, anything. You know, I'm f I'm fine with it. I think we've done covered a lot of ground. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Sure thing.